Welcome to Washed by the Word. I'm Pastor Khan, and I wanted to personally welcome you to our Sunday morning service as we go verse by verse through God's Word. It's our desire here by Washed by the Word that the Spirit of God will speak to you intimately as we go verse by verse through His Word. So welcome again to our Sunday morning service, and I look forward to hearing from all of you, sharing with us what God has shown you today as you get washed by the Word. We've been walking through Ruth. We're in chapter 3 today. We're going to pick up where we left off. We left off in chapter 3, verse 7. We'll start in verse 1, kind of work our way through. As a reminder, important, so important for us guys today to remember that as we get into the book of Ruth, we want to see what the Lord has for us today. It's not just a cool love story. It is that. But what does it mean for us today? What principles can we take for us today? What can we learn from the book of Ruth? We've talked many times about types, anti-types, and scripture and all. As we get into chapter 3, we want to remember that Boaz is a strong picture of Jesus Christ. So as we look at Boaz and we start to see the things that he does and the way he is presented in the, the book of Ruth, it's a beautiful picture of our Boaz, our greater than Boaz. And as we look at Ruth, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, and again last week, remember, she's an awesome picture of the church, of us, of you and me. As we see this woman who has been way out in Moab, today now coming to her kinsman redeemer and asking him to cover her. That's what we'll be looking at today in chapter 3. Now, let's go ahead and just pick up in chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not our relative? The word there is goel. G-O-E-L, Goel. It's been translated out kinsman, redeemer, near relative. It was that special position. Remember, we talked about this, that special position where he had the responsibility to keep the family name going. He had the responsibility to acquire land that had been lost by the family. So he would buy it back. He would redeem it. If someone died without having children, so his name would not be perpetuated down through the years, it was the responsibility of the Goel of the family, the closest living relative, to take the widow as his own, marry her, and raise up a family in honor of the man who had died. The firstborn son would take on that man's lineage. That was the Goel, a man who had responsibility to redeem that which was lost, to bring into the family that which was not there because of circumstances. As we look at this now, she says, is not Boaz, the young woman, is he not our relative? And we, we saw in chapter 2, remember, that Ruth just happened to go across to that field. And we, we talked about, you know, there's no such thing as something just happening. God directs our path. God directs the places we go, the things we see, the things we do. God is in control, which makes it really sweet during election years. Because God's in control. Calm yourself. We take our responsibility. We, we investigate. We look. We vote. And we trust God. No need to go lose our Christian testimony over politics. No reason to lose our Christian testimony over whacked out neighbors. Rose, don't lose your testimony over those crazy neighbors across the street. <laughs> That's us. <laughs> but, but, um, so just, you know, but don't lose your testimony over crazy things. God's in control. And that's what we're going to see today. God's got this and God loves you. That's going to be the whole crux of Ruth chapter 3. Now Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not our Goel? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, go to the threshing floor. But he says, prepare, she says, tells her, prepare yourself before you go meet your Boaz. Prepare yourself before you go to the threshing floor to seek Boaz's actions. 
And then she says, wash yourself, anoint yourself, and put on your best garment. Last week we went into depth in that and we said before we come into the presence of God, it's a good idea to wash ourselves. Remember we went to Ephesians chapter 5 about how the Lord washes his church with the washing of water of the word and all. And we said, what a reminder it is for us before we rush into the presence of our Lord to wash ourselves in his word. And the importance of daily washing ourselves in the word. And ah, I don't even know what to say anymore. I, I don't know what to say. 25 years of ministry now it's still 100%. Think about that, 100%. I have yet to find anyone ever come to me and say, you know, we've been in the Word too much. My husband just keeps bringing me into the presence of God through the Word of God. It's driving me crazy. But I'm here to tell you, the number of problems and issues that come across a path so are you spending a little bit of time with the Lord in His Word? A little bit. Well, every Tuesday I try to, but I, I just I listen to the radio. Well, good, listen to the radio, but get in the Word. Amen. Husbands, man up. Read the Word to your wife. Don't have to teach it. Read it. Just read the Word. Read the Word for yourself. Read the Word to your wife. An amazing thing will happen. The enemy will really try to mess with you, I guarantee you. He will try to get you to think, oh, this is stupid. Works with me all the time. I hate that. Don't buy into it. Read the word to your wife. You can always tell how the men are doing at home. The Bible says that the wife is the glory of the husband. All you have to do is look at the wife. That's a reflection on the husband, but it just reflects the husband. That's it. It's just it's it. Remember, we saw before that the wife was the glory. It meant reflection of the husband. So husbands, when we look at our wives, I don't like what we see. That's because she's reflecting you. She's reflecting your weakness. Well, she's just a bitter woman. Well, you made her that way. Calm yourself. Get into the Word of God. Wash her with the Word. Get right with your wife. Simple as that. Simple as that. So we saw washing yourself, the importance of getting in the Word. And anointing. She anointed herself. We talked about anointing uh, being used oftentimes of the Holy Spirit and how important it is for us to ask God to anoint us regularly. Of course, we receive the Holy Spirit when we're born again, and we can receive the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It tells us in Luke 11 that if we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more will Heavenly Father give His Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And we've had many services where we ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, of course. But on a regular basis, ask God to anoint you with His Spirit for ministry. Daily, get in the Word, Lord, anoint me today that I might be used by you. God, help me to see it's not about me. It's not about how I feel. It's not about, oh, stop it. It's about Jesus. It's so easy to forget that. It's so easy to make it about me, to make it about you. It's about Jesus. That's why we're here to tell people of Jesus. That's why we're here. Uh, we were in Jeremiah. You're here, you know we've been in Jeremiah. It's a long book. We keep getting these Jeremiah illustrations. Sorry. But Connie and I were reading through Jeremiah, and we came in chapter 38, and there was a man there named ebed Melech. And ebed Melech means servant of God, or, yeah, servant of God. And ebed Melech had heard that Jeremiah had been tossed in the dungeon. And it said he had sunk in the mire. It's like, ugh, he's in that. And ebed Millet goes to the king and says, he's going to die. He's going to starve down there. We've got to get him up. And the king says, do whatever you want. Go ahead, do it. So ebed Millet brings him up. He says, hey, Jeremiah. And down and think of an empty well or a well full of junk. And here's a rope, but here's some rags. And he throws the rags down there. And he says, put these rags under your armpits. Put the ropes there so you don't get hurt as we pull you up. And I thought, what a beautiful picture it is of what we should be doing as we get into the Word of God, as we ask God to anoint us, to help people, godly people, who have fallen into the muck and mire of the world and need a hand, not a hand out, they need a hand up. But to help them up in such a way that they don't have rope burns, they're not hurt and embarrassed and humiliated by the help that they get, but that we help them up gently and they come up strong. Ebed Melech. So we wash in the word. 
We ask God to anoint us. Then he put on the garment. We looked in Colossians, remember, taking off the old stuff and putting on the new garment of praise. We went in the Psalms and talked about the garment of praise and all. And as we looked at that, we said how important it is for us every day to get in the Word, to ask God to anoint us, and to actually praise Him. Praise Him. So important as we prepare to go to the threshing floor. We saw Ruth, remember, in chapter 2, she was in the field of Boaz, gleaning for herself. Now we're going to see her go to the threshing floor of Boaz, not gleaning for herself, but giving of herself. What a difference. But before we can give of ourselves, we need to be in the Word. We need to have the anointing of the Spirit of God. We have to be in a heart of praise. And as she humbly, we're going to see, comes to the feet of Boaz and says, Here I am. So let's pick up in verse 3 again. Therefore, wash yourself, anoint yourself, put on your best garment, go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies. We talked about that. We remembered in the Gospel of Matthew when the angels pointed to the empty tomb and said to Mary Magdalene and the women, look where he had laid. How important it is for us as we prepare to present ourselves for real to Jesus. It's one thing to be gleaning for ourselves in his field, but to really come to the threshing floor, that place of separation where the chaff is blown away and the fruit falls down. So important for us to wash, to anoint, to dress in praise, and then to look at the place, the empty tomb, and remember that the God that we are coming to is a resurrected Jesus Christ, a powerful Jesus Christ. Not the antithesis of the world. It's not the world here and Jesus here. No, 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 no. We're talking Jesus. And to remember, this is the resurrected God, creator of the universe, who loves you. So it comes to Boaz. Look at the place where he lies, and then go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. After Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Remember, he's there guarding his grain. It was during the period of judges when everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. And he's there to guard his grain. So he's sleeping there by the grain. And while he's there sleeping, she came softly. She came humbly. She came quietly. She uncovered his feet and lay down. And that is where we pick up today. So there she is laying at his feet. This is not some type of a inappropriate thing. This is a very common thing. She is going to the family's goel and basically saying, here I am. You have a responsibility to keep our family lineage going. I'm here. So he's laying there sleeping, and all of a sudden his feet get cold. And it happened at midnight that the man was startled. And you can believe he was startled. He went to sleep probably with both eyes only half open because he's guarding his grain. And all of a sudden he turns in the dark, and there's a woman lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she says, well, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. And what a beautiful picture it is is we have the Goel, and we have Ruth having washed, anointed, dressed appropriately, looking at where he had lain, humbly, didn't come demanding, we're going to see, didn't demand, look, you're my Goel, you need to do this for me. No. She came humbly, softly, quietly, said, here I am. She came to his feet. There was a Danish sculptor who had carved a life-sized sculpture of Jesus. But as you looked at the sculpture, you couldn't see the face of Jesus. He was kind of wrapped around. And alongside of the sculpture, it said, to see the face of Jesus, you have to sit at his feet. And as you would sit at the feet of the statue and look up, you'd see the face of Jesus. And, and what, what, a, what a message that is. We talked about that last week, about coming to the feet of the Lord. We went into Luke chapter 10, remember, with Martha and Mary. And we saw how Martha was so busy serving, 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 serving. And Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Martha got burned out with her serving. And he says, Jesus, don't you care? 
I'm working, preparing, doing all this stuff, and Mary's not helping me. Will you tell Mary to help me? And we, we looked at that and said, one of the issues when we get real busy doing whatever, it can be serving or we can just be busy being stupid. But when we get real busy, we tend to tell Jesus what to do, and we tend to think he doesn't care. Remember Jesus' response, Martha, Martha, whenever the Lord speaks with compassion, with a heartfelt message, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wanted to take you like a, a mother hen. Peter, Peter, the Lord, uh, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. Martha, Martha, you're stressed out about a lot of things, but Mary has chosen that good part. What a message, what a theme for us to remember how easy it is to get busy doing good things and get ripped off from doing the best thing. How easy it is to let tasks take us away from time at the feet of Jesus. Good tasks. Got to make a living. Do you? Really? Do you? Well, I, I, I got to work out. Really? Do you? I got to eat. Really? Do you? But it's amazing what happens when we sit at the feet of Jesus. Jesus says, Mary has picked the one thing that's needed, coming to the feet of Jesus. That quiet time with the Lord. I want to encourage you all again, spend that time at the feet of Jesus. Praying, praising, getting in his word, asking for his anointing, seeking his will, spending time with the Lord. Forget about counseling. Go to Jesus. Forget about the extra job. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Watch what happens. Just try it. Just try it. Not a try it for three years. If it doesn't work, forget about it. Not long. You don't have to do it a long time. You don't have to do it a long time. But try it for three years and see how your life goes. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I was talking with, I think it was Charmaine or Martha, or May, I think it was Charmaine, but one of the two of you I was talking. And I, I, I mentioned to you guys how thrilled I am that when the doors are open as new believers, you're here. And it's an amazing thing what will happen. That if you stay plugged in to being consistently exposed to the Word of God, you're going to grow. You are just going to grow. You can't help it. You're going to grow. Your worldview will become a biblical worldview. Things that used to be temptations and problems will slowly start to go away. It's an amazing thing. God works on our hearts. We don't have to be telling everybody, don't do that, don't do that. Stop it. Just love one another. Let the Lord take care of it. God's got this. The God that I know, the God that I love, the God that saved me, He's much bigger and better than anything I or any of you can ever do. We are not responsible for each other's walks. We're responsible for our own relationship with Jesus. And if we just love one another, set a good example for one another, encourage one another, it's going to be just fine. It is not about being perfect to be used. It's about being used by a perfect God. That's what we want. So now, it happened at midnight. He was startled. He says, who are you? And she says, well, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. And then she says something interesting. In the New King James, eh, it says, take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a Goel, a close relative, a kinsman redeemer. Uh, a lot of translations have another thing in place of take your maidservant under your wing. It means the same thing. It means be my Goel, a lot of the more recent uh, translations have spread the corner of your garment over your maidservant. Take me under your garment. Make me part of your family. I am making myself available to you and asking you to be my Goel. My Goel. It was a way of claiming a woman for your wife in Arab society for years. In fact, it still is today in some Arab pockets. They will take a garment and put it over the woman to say, she's mine. In Judaism, they have even today something called a talith. And at the wedding ceremony, the 
the Jewish man will throw his skirt, his talith, over the bride, saying, you're mine. Amos and Robin at the wedding. What was that thing called? Tartan. We had a Scottish wedding. And pronounced them husband and wife, and Amos took his tartan and pinned it onto his brand new bride as a way of saying, you're part of my clan. It's that same concept. It's an ancient biblical concept, and that's what's going on here with Ruth. She says, pin your tartan on me. Cover me with your, the hem of your garment. Take me into the family. Be that goel. So he says, take your maidservant under your wing. Spread the corner of your garment over your maidservant. For you are a goel. And that becomes the question, the drama. She has just made herself available to him saying, take your responsibility, will he do it? Will Boaz be the Goel? I mean, she's asking a lot. Remember what country she's from? Moab. Yeah, she's from Moab. That's tough. In Jeremiah 48, of course it's Jeremiah, but in Jeremiah 48, verse 11, it talks about God saying, I'm going to judge Moab. And he says something interesting in there. He says, you know, Moab has settled on her dregs. She has not been poured from vessel to vessel. And you, you read that and you go, say what now? Those of you that have ever gone through a hard time, listen to this. This is pretty sweet. We've taught this in the past a couple years back. But remember when they would make the wine in the Middle East back in the day. They would take the, the fermented grapes and they would squeeze them and get this wine. And then a good winemaker would let the wine sit in that vessel for a while while the impurities went to the bottom. They were called dregs. Then they would take the bottle and also carefully pour it into a new bottle so as to get the top part of it, but not the dregs. Leave the dregs in the bottle. And then they let it sit in this bottle and let the dregs sink down. And then they'd pour it again and they'd pour it again, and they'd pour it again, and they'd pour it again, until finally there'd be no drag settling, and then you'd have this very pure, the best of the wine. Well, God uses that example, and he says, Moab has settled on its dregs. If you didn't pour that wine from the dregs, the wine had a real bitter taste. And it's amazing because Moab was wealthy as a nation, prosperous, they were powerful, they were politically connected, they had it all going on. And yet, God says, they've settled on their dregs because they have not been poured. You ever been poured? You're going, oh, no, not this, and I'm, I like it here. And he pours you into another vessel. No! As you pour, get poured, all the dregs stay behind. Then he pours you again. No! Again and again. If we go through life and never being poured, we can end up at the end of life being very bitter. This is all there was to life, really? This is it? So instead of when upheaval comes in our life, instead of saying, oh, poor me, say, oh, Lord, poor me. <laughs> poor me, Lord. Let, just get the bitterness out of my life. Uh, when I go through hard times, I tend to like to play the victim. Anybody do that besides me? If things are bad, it's all about me and the poor me. Don't you just feel bad for me? Come on, guys. Oh, man. <laughs> I am so whacked. <laughs> I just... <sighs> go through hard times. Count it all joy. Amen. When you fall into various troubles, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have that perfect... Let, let, have that perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Hard times, pour me, Lord. Not pour me. Pour me, my eyes are on me. Pour me, Lord, my eyes are on Jesus and what he has for me. The dregs. Well, she was a Moabite. The Moabites hadn't been poured, God says. In fact, he says, no Moabite should ever come into the congregation of the Lord. He says in Deuteronomy, I think it's 23. For 10 generations, keep the Moabites away. They're whacked. Well, here in the middle of the night, who's here? A Moabite woman. Yep, she's been washed. She's anointed herself. She's got her best clothes on. She's looked to where, see where he's laid. She lays down, comes humbly, and she says, you're our Goel. 
The question is, will a prosperous, highly successful, well-established man, the grandson of Rahab and Salmon, I mean, this is a major family in Judah, will he reach out and redeem a Moabite? Oh, man. She's the least of the least. She's a Moabite. You ever see that commercial where that pig is taking tickets at the movie theater? And they come in, they give him the ticket, and he's, oh, you're seeing that one. Oh, that's a good one. But don't worry about it. He dies in the end. Remember that? And he's just telling the end of all the movies? I did that with Connie at a movie. <laughs> I'd seen the movie, and I, I said, yeah, let's go see it. You'll like it. It ends like, and I told her. After I said, she gave me the look, and I go, I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> I did that. Sorry, babe. We're going to do that now. I'm going to show you the end of the movie. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew. Matthew chapter 1. Because there we see the genealogy of the Jewish Messiah. And as we look at the genealogy of the Jewish Messiah, this is that bloodline, that, that line that Jesus comes through all the way from Abraham. It's, it's listed here. And as we go in verse 4, it says, Ram begot Abinadab, and Abinadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Say what now? So Boaz's mom was Rahab. Rahab, a Canaanite prostitute, in the line of Jesus. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. A Moabite, so I guess he's going to take her in. We go a little bit later, and, and, and we, we also see that even Bathsheba was used and was in the genealogy of Jesus, the adulteress. So we see that in the family of God, that covering of our Redeemer goes pretty far out there. We're going to see here in just a minute, it even goes into the Moabite region. And that's going to be very good for us, because oftentimes the question comes up, does it not in our own mind, will God redeem me? Will he cover me? I'm spiritually bankrupt. I got nothing. Do you know what I've done? Do you know who I am? God, will you spread your covering over me? God, I've got a Moabite nature. He says, she says, take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Then he says, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning. He says, I was blessed. I was blessed when you were in my field. They say, well, that's awesome. I got this young Moabite girl in my field. I was blessed. And then you came and started gleaning. What a blessing that you gleaned. Realize God is blessed if you're here today. Maybe you don't know the Lord yet. Maybe you slid away from the Lord. But you're blessing him just by being here. Just being in his field. Just say, well, I guess I'm here. Realize how you bless the Lord when you say, Lord, I'm going to meet with you this morning, just you and me. I want to spend time with you. Lord, I want, to, I want to glean from your word. God knows that you could have went to the mountains this weekend. God knows you could be on a golf course right now. Lord knows you could sleep in right now, all the things we put in front of him. He knows that. But he says, you're here. Me and you and you in my word this morning. We're just spending time on a Tuesday morning early, just spending time with me, and it blesses him. And Boaz says, you bless, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter. You show me more kindness at the end, now at the threshing floor, than at the beginning in the field, and that you did not go after young men. You could have. Ruth, you could have went after these young studs all around you, but instead, you're coming to... Uh, you, mm, mm. <laughs> Realize what a blessing it is to the Lord when we come to Him at the threshing floor, the place, the place of separation. And we say, Lord, will you cover me? Lord, will you redeem me? Lord, will you bring me into you? He says, you're blessing me when you say that. I know you could have went after a fad. 
You could have went after a concert. You could have went after whatever you want to go after. There's all kinds of things we can do. We all know that. And God says, instead of that, you're, you want to be part of my family? You bless me. I created you to be part of my family. Of course. So you don't have to the young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, don't fear. I will do for you all that you request for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. One translation says, all the people of my, tone, my town know that you are a bride worth winning. I love that translation. You're a virtuous woman. Realize how God sees you. The world tells us we're worthless. People tell us, oh, you're a mess. God sees you and says, you're a bride worth winning. God loves you. It makes no difference how far into Moab you have gone. God loves you. And if we just come to him humbly at his feet, say, Lord, I'm here. Now, it is true that I'm a close relative. It's true I'm a Goel. However, there is a relative closer than I. If you're a soap opera person, that's where the organ plays. <laughs> Stay this night. I know who watches soaps now. That's good. Stay this night. And in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him perform it. But if he does not want to perform the duty of you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. He says, of course I'll do it. But there's one closer. Let's see if... He wants to do it. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. Then he says, don't let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor, guarding her reputation. Also, he said, bring the shawl that is on you to Ruth and hold it. And she held it, and he measured six somethings of barley. Notice ephahs and italics. We don't know what it is. I don't think it's ephahs. I think it's a really poor guess by whoever put that in there, because six ephahs, you'd have to have a strong horse to carry that much. So unless Ruth is 6'8 and really strong, I don't know. But a six-something, six-something of barley, and he, he laid it on her, and she went into the city. Then she came to her mother-in-law, and her mother-in-law saw, is that you, my daughter? In the Hebrew, it seems to be saying, how did it go? Is that you? Are you now the, the person with a goel? That type of question. And she told her all that the man had done for her. And then... Ruth says to Naomi, these six, whatever these are, of barley, he gave me. And he said to me, do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. And there are all kinds of uh, different ideas. Uh, what does this mean? Is it, is it a secret message from Boaz to Naomi? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Some have said, well, six days God created the the earth and the seventh day he rested, so that tells Naomi he's going to get to work doing it and he's not going to rest. And Boy, I don't know. Or maybe that's just what he, how much it fit in the shawl. I don't know. But he gave her that. He, he says, bring this to your mother-in-law. And, and Naomi says, oh man, he's involved. Sit still, my daughter. Calm yourself. Until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he's concluded the matter this day. As we look at this, we want to remember, Boaz is the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, that near relative. He's a picture of Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, our Goel, our redeemer. The word redeemer, as it's used here, is very interesting because it's in a continuance, uh, it implies continuous redemption. So realize that, okay, you gave your life to Christ, pick your year, whatever year you were born again. And he became your redeemer. But it's in a continuous sense. So since then, you went back to Moab. We call it backsliding. Realize you don't come back and get saved again. But you do come back to Jesus. And we confess our sin if we confess our sin, turning from our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we come back to Jesus. We draw near to God. He draws near to us. We wash our hands. We purify our hearts. We get close to the Lord. We come humbly to his feet. And we say, Lord, I've been in Moab. Will you cover me? We know that answer. The Lord just stretches out and covers
He forgives. You know why he does that? Because he loves you. You know why we judge other people? Because we don't love them. That's why Jesus doesn't judge you if you're his family. If you're born again, he loves you if you're not born again. But if, he love, if you're born again, he loves you. You backslide and you ask for forgiveness and you truly repent and come back. He's going to take you in because he loves you. When we judge others, it's a sign that... <sighs> Just love one another. Just love one another. Don't gossip. Don't judge. Just love. Do we have a great God or what? Amen. I just love the Lord. He forgives and he forgives and he forgives. Look at yourself right now and realize he forgives you. He forgives you. Draw close to our Goel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again so much just for a chance to walk through this portion of your word again. God, to see how you are such a glorious, awesome redeemer. God, give us the wisdom to truly wash in your word, to have you anoint us with your spirit, to praise you, to remember your resurrection, to come to your feet, to sit at your feet that we might see your face. Lord, to ask you for forgiveness and to take us back into that close relationship with you again. God, thank you for being our Redeemer continually. Lord, you are so amazing. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the reminder again today that you love us. Lord, that we don't earn your love. You just love us. Lord, we make a lot of messes. God, we are crazed people. And you love us. Thank you, Lord, for your love. God, thank you for forgiving us when we come to you. Thank you for being the God that holds us, that covers us, that loves us, that directs us. Lord, as we get ready to head out today, God, we ask that you would fill us afresh with your spirit. Lord, that your love would flow through us into the lives of others. God, give us wisdom to see where it is you would have us walk today. Lord, we pray for our friends, our family members, people here, people out there in our sphere of influence that are struggling, Lord, struggling with addictions, struggling with anger, struggling with lust, struggling with unforgiveness, struggling with loneliness. God, we just pray for our friends, our family, our acquaintances, God, that are hurting right now, and we ask, Lord, that you you, God, would minister specifically to them right now. Lord, that we would be like ebed Melech, helping godly people who are buried in the muck and the mire to give them a, a hand up, gently, lovingly, but firmly. Lord, we have prayed for five years that this little fellowship would be a spiritual hospital that people could come here who have been spiritually hurt, diseased, broken. God, forgive us when we complain that there are people here who are spiritually sick, diseased, and broken. God, you've been so faithful. God, we thank you for the hurting. God, give us wisdom to minister, to help, to love those that are hurting. And God, we're asking you to bring more in. Lord, we're asking for more hurting people. People caught up in sin. People that feel that nobody wants them. God, bring them here. We just want to love them and tell them about you. Lord, give us hearts to minister to the lost. Lord, thank you for being good. As we gather now in a few moments just to fellowship, God, we ask that you'd bless our meal, our time. You'd be pleased with our conversation. Thank you for the way you provide for us. In Jesus' name, amen.